and imaging is uh, that the understanding of uh, the underlying processes and the nomenclature is a little confusing. At a fundamental level, diffusion-weighted imaging seeks to measure the ease with which water molecules are able to diffuse in any particular voxel, and therefore it gives us an insight into essentially the histology of that tissue, how cellular it is, what the extracellular space is, what the intracellular space is. This can be very useful in uh, distinguishing various entities as well as uh, tumour grading, for example. Although the exact mechanisms and the proportion of diffusion-weighted imaging signal generated by water in different cellular and extracellular compartments remains controversial and uh, remains a focus of study, as a general principle one can think about the majority of diffusion-weighted imaging looking essentially only at extracellular fluid. And the terminology uh, most commonly used is whether or not a mass or a region of the brain demonstrates restricted diffusion, which actually implies whether there's abnormally decreased diffusivity. In other words, water molecules are having a greater degree of difficulty diffusing long distances compared to what that tissue should exhibit were it normal. A somewhat less frequently used term is facilitated diffusion, which is the opposite. And that's used to denote when water molecules can diffuse greater distances than would be expected. And so generally, restricted diffusion is due to reduction in the size of the extracellular fluid compartment between cells, whereas facilitated diffusion results from widening of the extracellular fluid compartment, such as the addition of additional fluid, as is seen in vasogenic edema. In most centres, we are supplied not only with what we usually refer to as the DWI image, which is usually a B1000 image, and we'll see what that means in a second, but also with the ADC map, which is apparent diffusion coefficient. Uh, the diffusion coefficient is a real physical value uh, of how easy it is for water molecules to diffuse, and uh, it's measured in millimetres squared per second. And these are true values, and on uh, scanners that are appropriately set up, you can put a ROI on any part of the brain and read off the mean value. And uh, this is very reproducible, both within the magnet and across magnets. Uh, typical values, and I'm going to use very rounded numbers here just to make it easy to remember, is that CSF is typically 3,200 times 10 to the minus 6, whereas white matter is around 800 times 10 to the minus 6. Now, putting aside normal images, we should, at this point, talk about the concept of T2 shine through. Again, there's a lot of confusion around what exactly this means, but most of us know that trying to interpret DWI images in isolation, or the B1000 images in isolation, can lead to difficulty distinguishing true restricted diffusion from what we call T2 shine through. On uh, this side, we have an acute ischemic stroke with very high DWI signal, and here a low-grade glioma demonstrates some elevation. Of signal. Now on these images you can probably assume that this is real and in this one it's hard to know because uh, gliomas can demonstrate variable diffusion restriction depending on the cellularity on the grade. Therefore we would always want to review ADC maps and on uh, this side we can confirm that the restricted diffusion is abnormally high so the ADC values are lower than normal. It is blacker than what that tissue should be. Whereas in the low-grade glioma, that tissue demonstrates a higher signal intensity on ADC, so higher ADC values. This is not restricted diffusion, or not abnormally restricted diffusion, but rather facilitated diffusion. And so we would usually say that the high signal on diffusion-weighted imaging is due to T2 shine-through. One of the problems with this terminology is that it makes it sound as if you either have true restricted diffusion or true T2 shine-through when in fact all diffusion-weighted images have a combination of both T2 signal and diffusion depending on the tissue. So going back to our normal examples, most of us will have encountered at some point this third sequence that forms uh, the trifecta of diffusion-weighted imaging, which is a B0, B1000 and apparent diffusion coefficient maps or ADC maps. And one of the challenges is that at first glance a B0 and an ADC look quite similar and one can mistakenly look at the B0 value to try and establish whether something has a T2 shine-through component or not. 
Now the relationship between B0 and B1000 is that the combination of the two allows you to calculate an ADC and this is in fact why we obtain the two and this is how we generate the ADC maps. The relationship between these three sequences is um, actually this and uh, trust me we're not going to go into the too much detail uh, but it is worth looking at it because it actually helps you un understand and conceptualize what is going on with these sequences. So we have three components. We have the signal intensity of diffusion weighted imaging. This is your DWI or B1000 say uh, image is equal to the signal intensity on your B0 which is just a T2 weighted EPI sequence times the negative exponential of B times the ADC. And so what this results in is if you have a very high T2 signal such as CSF and very high ADC values, say 3200, then you're going to end up with a very small number. So this value is attenuated very significantly and you end up with black CSF. In contrast, if you have an intermediate T2 signal and uh, intermediate ADC, you will end up with intermediate signal on uh, DWI. And if that sounds a little bit confusing or not terribly intuitive, that's true and that's the reason why just looking at a DWI image makes it difficult to establish how much of a true restricted diffusion component there is and how much T2 shine through there is. Another term that causes a great deal of confusion to resonance is the term B, the B value. And what exactly does this denote? It appears twice in this, uh, once as a B0 and once uh, within the exponential component. And the B is actually made up of a number of terms and we really don't need to know this. But suffice to say, one of these is a gyromagnetic ratio which is fixed according to the strength of your magnet. A couple of them are part of the sequence and parameters. And the one that I think makes it easiest to understand what is going on in diffusion and the one that we'll be using conceptually to understand the effect of changing your B value is the time between your gradient pulses. In other words, how long you wait between the start of the sequence and when you read out the echo, having given enough time for water molecules to diffuse through the tissue. So we're going to look and pretend that that's the only thing that we're changing. I took... Um, the liberty of getting one of my long-suffering technologists to be scanned at multiple B values. And here we can see a normal brain ranging from the B0 to a B2000. And most centers would perform B1000 in the brain. And this is the DWI image that we're mostly familiar with. And as you can see, this there is a smooth gradation across the signal intensity. And if we concentrate on CSF, for example, it remains bright until we get to about a B value of 500 at which point it's ISO intense, and then it becomes progressively darker. In contrast, if we have a look at a white matter across different B values, it remains essentially the same signal intensity regardless of uh, the B value. So let's have a look at these two voxels and try and understand what's going on to account for these differences. So here we have at the bottom, we have our B values, which are really, let's just say, time, and we've denoted water molecules as blue dots, and here we have only water molecules and we have a lot of them, therefore we have a lot of T2 signal on our B0. Whereas in the white matter we have fewer water molecules and they are trapped or constrained by axons. And so as we move forward in time and go to a B value of 100, we've only waited a little bit, water molecules have only moved slightly, nothing much has changed. As we start to move further forward and double the time up to a B of 200, you'll see now that some of these water molecules have left the voxel. And that means that they are no longer present to return signal. And uh, as expected, the CSF signal has dropped somewhat. Now, because these water molecules are stuck between these axons, their ability to diffuse long distances is much reduced. So as we go forward in time, we can see that more and more of the water molecules that are in the CSF within the ventricle have left the voxels, whereas only a couple of water molecules in the white matter are able to leave, accounting for why the signal intensity really doesn't change much. By the time we get to a B1000, there are very few water molecules left in the original voxel, and therefore there is very little signal, whereas most of the water molecules remain in the white matter. 
and therefore the signal has not really changed. So let's have a look at a few examples to see the application of diffusion weighted imaging and what the underlying processes that account for this restricted diffusion are. The one that we're most familiar with is acute ischemic stroke and really the introduction of diffusion weighted imaging was revolutionary in the assessment of acute stroke because diffusion weighted imaging demonstrates a stroke within a few minutes, in fact probably a few seconds of cessation of normal blood flow. So in this uh, pretend voxel here we've uh, denoted cells as orange and water molecules as blue. And as soon as the blood flow to a part of the brain is ceased, ATP is depleted very quickly and therefore sodium potassium pumps cease to work. The result of this is that sodium floods into the cell, taking with it water and resulting in cellular swelling. This cellular swelling results in turn in narrowing of the extracellular compartment such that the distance between adjacent cells is much smaller than before and therefore the distance that these water molecules can bounce around in is reduced. Uh, as a result, ADC values drop and there is true restricted diffusion. As I mentioned before, the exact physics uh, behind exactly what is happening and what compartments are contributing to restricted diffusion is still an ongoing area of research as water molecules not only are trapped in the extracellular space but do move into the cell and do adhere via various forces to cell membrane and organelle membranes. But the concept of extracellular space being a determinant for ADC values is one that's very helpful so that's uh, what we're going to use for this discussion. And so as we mentioned before normal white matter would be in the order of about 800 whereas an acute infarct would be much lower than that, typically let's say half that, about 400. In contrast, if we look at a high-grade glioma or glioblastoma, we have this typical appearance of a heterogeneously enhancing mass with areas of necrosis, which gives this sort of ADC, where the enhancing components typically are the ones that show the reduced ADC value. By reduced ADC values in gliomas, we're actually talking about areas that return to approximately normal white matter diffusion, so about 800, say. When we look at these regions of lower ADC values, these correlate with areas on histology of high cellularity. The cells are larger, they're dysplastic, and uh, the extracellular space is compressed. Note that in areas of necrosis, as demonstrated here, there's not much cellular structure, and therefore the ease with which water molecules can diffuse is increased. And here we have uh, very high ADC values. If we look at this diagrammatically, we see that the extracellular space is narrowed due to these large uh, malignant cells. One of the very useful features of ADC values in imaging gliomas is that they're fairly tightly correlated with tumor grade. And these are very rough figures again, but grade two have facilitated diffusion compared to normal white matter of say 1200, whereas grade three are around 1000 and grade four tumors, so glioblastomas, return to approximately the values of normal white matter. And one final example, that of lymphoma, we can see on these uh, T1 post contrast and ADC maps, a patient with a cortical lymphoma, very vividly enhancing tumor involving the cortex, uh, which have strikingly low ADC values. And this is due to high cellularity. These are small round blue cell type tumors, and um, they exhibit similar diffusion restriction to other tumors of that sort of histology namely medulloblastoma and peanuts, for example, uh, because lots of small blue cells tightly packed together. And diagrammatically, it would have this appearance. The cells themselves are not terribly large, uh, but they are tightly packed, reducing the extracellular component. It's worth noting on this image that there is vasogenic edema, and note that where there is the influx of additional water molecules spreading out normal axons, then we have facilitated diffusion. One final point to um, cover is that of diffusion tensor imaging or tractography because this is just an extension of what we've seen before. If we look, go back to our diagram of normal white matter, we'll recall that as time passes, as you go from a B0 to a B1000, water molecules uh, move but are largely restricted in their motion by the surrounding axons such that the direction and uh, distance that they move is aligned with axons rather than across axons. 
we have the ability to measure the diffusion in different directions. If we measure enough directions, we are able to calculate for each voxels what the dominant direction of fibers in that voxel is, and therefore then generate maps of white matter tracks as indicated. So I hope that has been of some use, and I look forward to your company at the end of August. Diffusion weighted and diffusion tensor imaging are MR techniques that can evaluate and quantify molecular diffusion in the body.